just as folks continue to gather in this morning, we're going to sing a few choruses together. We're going to begin with this one. Ascribe greatness to our God the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. This is a short one. We'll sing it twice through and sing out as we worship God this morning. a great start to our singing this morning. Let's keep it up with this lovely old piece. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Let's keep up that good singing.
this, our last chorus before opening our service. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after, after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. We'll sing the whole piece together. As we begin our service this morning, let me wish all of you fathers a happy Father's Day. It's good to see each of you out, and I'm sure you have maybe been spoiled already this morning by children, maybe breakfast in bed, I don't know. Um, but it was good that we can come to the house of the Lord and worship our Heavenly Father this morning. And our opening hymn is, What Gift of Grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. The Heavenly Father has given his best for us. There's no more for heaven to give. And we can sing this morning, what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? We'll stand and we'll sing after the introduction.
Amen. Let's come before the Lord now and let's ask for his blessing upon us this morning. Let's ask him to meet with us. We were reminding ourselves upstairs this morning how the Lord, he indeed is here because he's promised where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. But we want to know that presence with us this morning. And I want you to ask the Lord to speak to you this morning individually. Take a moment just now and ask him to speak. And we want him to meet with each of us as a congregation today. And that as we open his word, he would speak. And that we would hear words from him. So let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we bow humbly and reverently in your most holy presence this morning. And we thank you, Father, that we come through the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for this, the Lord's Day, when we can gather together with your people and ascribe greatness to our God, the Rock. We thank you, Father, that we have sang already this morning that your work is perfect. That, Father, all your ways are just. And, Father, as we come before you today, we praise and magnify your name. You're the great God and greatly to be praised. And, Father, it is our privilege to gather as your people today and to worship you. We thank you, Father, for this day, Father's Day. We thank you indeed today for each of the fathers who are gathered in with us. We thank you for those who listen in online. We thank you, Father, for all that they do. We thank you, Father, for many of us we can speak of godly fathers who have pointed us to Christ and led us that way. And Father, we thank you this morning for each one here. They are precious to us. And Father, we just pray that indeed they will be blessed today in Father's Day, that Father, indeed they will enjoy spending time with children. And Father, we take a moment as well just to remember those who maybe that seat is empty today. And in recent years, maybe our Father has passed on. And Father, we pray that you will be with each of those who maybe feel that empty seat today. And we just pray for your blessing upon them. And Father, your hand would be upon them. But Father, we do thank you as we come before you as your people, that we can come and say, Abba, Father, because you are our God and you love us with an everlasting love. And that we can approach you and make our requests known to you. And that, Father, you love us deeply. We thank you, Father, that you sent your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross of Calvary. We thank you, Father, for the, bre- for the precious blood that was shed there, that the price of sin was paid, and that, Father, indeed, we can stand today, those of us who know Christ as Savior, and say, I am redeemed, and, Father, that we've been made fit for heaven. Father, we rejoice in that fact this morning, and, Father, we realize that you have given us your best, how we have sang what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. And Father, we praise you for that. Thank you that you have given us your best, your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, even this morning as we bow before you, that for each child of God, that we have the Spirit of God dwelling within our hearts. And Father, what a privilege we have this morning to know that God dwells in us. Father, we thank you today as we bow before you that, Father, we can just meet in this place. Father, we thank you indeed as well that as we bow in your presence for the week that has gone by, we thank you, Father, even for the witness that went out from this assembly yesterday as many came to Bambridge. And, Father, we pray that you would bless that witness and that, Father, you would use that witness and that, indeed, even though it would be seeds planted and maybe one or two would come to trust Christ as Savior. Father, we pray for those who gather in this morning who maybe are feeling the burden of another week. Father, maybe uh, they're cast down in their souls this morning. And Father, I just pray that you will lift them up this morning. That Father, as later on we consider the blessed assurance that you give each child of God. That Father, indeed, you will lift our hearts to praise you and adore you this morning. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, as we open it, it is an encouragement and it teaches us how we should live. And Father, we pray as we open it later on that, Father, that your voice would speak to each one of us. We pray, Father, that you will minister to us afresh, 
that, Father, we would know that you're speaking to us. And that, Father, as we leave, we will leave knowing that it was good for us to have been here because we met with the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for each boy and girl that's gathered in this place today. We praise you for them. We thank you for the privilege of having them here. And Father, we just pray that in a few moments' time, as we speak to the boys and girls, and even later on as they do go to Crescent and Children's Church, that, Father, you will bless them abundantly. Father, we pray for those who will be responsible teaching across the way this morning. And, Father, we just pray that you will save these boys and girls early in their life. And that, Father, indeed, that you would use them as mighty men and women for the Lord as they grow up. Father, we just pray indeed for those in our gathering this morning, maybe who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And Father, we pray that this day that you will visit us with your salvation. That Father, indeed, that you will bless us this day with salvation blessing. That we would rejoice with the angels in heaven, even over, even over one soul coming to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we long for it today. And Father, we ask that you will be pleased to, to answer our prayer. Father, we pray for those who would love to be with us, sat in these pews this morning, but are unable to be here due to ill health. Father, we continue to remember Christine. And we pray, Father, for your blessing upon her this morning. And John too. And Father, we just pray for them as they worship uh, this morning from their own home, that Father, you would bless them, that Father, you would encourage them. And may they know that many of God's people are praying for them and bringing their names before the throne often. And Father, we just pray that you will encourage them this day. Father, there are many others who would love to be in these pews and love to be out with us. And we pray, Father, for your blessing upon them today. We pray that you will wrap your everlasting arms around them, that they will know that you are very near at this time. And Father, indeed, that you would place your hands upon each one. And Father, just keep them safe in these days. May they know and rest in you. May they know the peace of God ministered in their hearts this morning. And Father, we pray indeed that you will bless them. Father, up and down our land, there are many gatherings very similar to ours this morning. And Father, this morning we pray, no matter the denomination, we pray where a gathering is faithful to the book and to the blood. And Father, where the gospel is faithfully proclaimed today, oh God, we pray that if, right up and down our land that there will be great signs following the preaching of your word. And that, Father, this would be a great day for the kingdom of God in our province here in Northern Ireland. Father, we long for you to move. We long for your spirit to sweep across our land once more. Father, there is so much evil going on in it. And, Father, we just pray indeed that in wrath you will remember mercy. And that, Father, you will look in our land and you will indeed move in a mighty way again. Father, we pray that you will be pleased to use us. Father, we pray as your people that we would be clean vessels and that we would be fit for the master's use. And Father, we just pray this morning that indeed that you would begin a work afresh in our hearts, that Father, you would set a fire alight in our hearts again, that Father, we would burn like the, our hearts would burn like the two in the road to Emmaus, and that Father, indeed, that we would live our lives in a Christ-like manner in all that we do. Father, we pray for your blessing upon us this morning. We pray, Father, that indeed that we will know your presence with us. And we pray all this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. Well, let me welcome you this morning. It's good to see each and every one of you out this morning. And once again, fathers, let me say happy Father's Day to you. Also, let me welcome those who listen in on Facebook Live. It's lovely to have you listening in. Thank you for tuning in to our services. And we really do appreciate many of you often comment and send messages of encouragement. And I know that both John and myself, we really do appreciate that. After our service this morning, we'll meet around the Lord's table. And if you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord, we invite you to remain behind and remember your Savior in the way that he has appointed. Don't forget the prayer meeting this evening at 5.45 p.m. in the upper room, and then our gospel service at 6.30 p.m. God willing, I will be speaking at this evening's service. Praise group, uh, you will be having a practice after the meeting this evening. That takes us round to Wednesday at 8 p.m., the Bible study and prayer meeting. And we'll be finishing our little series from Lethargy Awake in the book of Malachi. Thursday evening, the first aid training will continue from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. 
And then Friday evening, a special event in our church calendar, our church barbecue, and it will be beginning at 7 p.m. Please, if you're planning on going, please do write your name on the sheet in the foyer. Don't turn in and uh, not let us know you're coming, um, or else we mightn't have enough food for you, um, and you'll be left maybe going to have to buy your own burger somewhere else. Um, so please do write your name down. Let us know that you're coming to the barbecue on your way out this morning. There's a pen there and a wee sheet, and write your name down. Friday evening at 7 p.m. That takes us round to next Lord's Day, um, Sunday the 26th, prayer meeting at 10.45 a.m., or morning service and breaking of bread at 11.30 a.m. In the evening, the prayer meeting at 5.45 p.m., gospel service at 6.30 p.m., and God willing, next Lord's Day, I will be speaking at both services. Uh, child protection, if you missed the recent child protection evening with David Jackson, uh, please have a word with Sam Campbell about that matter. Don't forget um, the wee bags for Ukraine. Thank you so much for you, those of you who have filled bags and responded. There's been a great response for those bags. There's still empty bags out there. And if you think you can fill a few more, that would be great. And you can grab a few of those in your way out this morning. Also, I've been asked to announce this morning that the new crash rota is out. For, and that runs from the 3rd of July through to the 18th of December. And of course, all of these announcements are made subject <laughs> to the will of the Lord. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> yeah, the men at the back didn't have my permission for that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for praying that my knee would get better. It bent all right yesterday. <laughs> Well, boys and girls, let's move on quickly, eh? <laughs> let's move on quickly. Well, it is always good to see the boys and girls out. And boys and girls, it falls to me this morning to speak to you. And I thought since it's Father's Day, it would be good to speak on the topic of Father. And I would like to tell you three things about our Heavenly Father. And maybe you might be able to see these characteristics in your own daddy as well. And the first thing I want to tell you about is that your daddy, I'm sure you know that he cares for you. You know what? See, when you were a wee baby and you were born, and he took you in his arms, he maybe got a wee bit emotional. I know you, baby, don't think your daddy gets emotional, eh? You've never seen him cry, have you? But maybe that time he might have shed a wee tear when he saw his little precious bundle arrive, and there he was, and there she was. Maybe you were there. And one thing that you will know about your daddy, no matter what, is he cares very much much about you, doesn't he? He'll do so much for you. He'll show that he loves you. Maybe he'll drive you to the football or he'll drive you all over the show. My dad used to tell me that he was going to get a sticker that said, Dad's Taxi. And it got so bad, he said, that he was going to have to start charging us for all the places that he drove us to. But you know what? It's good to know that your daddy really cares for you and really loves you very much. But so much better this morning to know that we have a heavenly Father who cares for us very, very much. And you know what? It's not just you, boys and girls. This is something that everybody can understand this morning, something that everybody can be encouraged by this morning. No matter what you go through, no matter in life what you've been through, we have a God who loves us very, very much. You know, it's really easy sometimes to say, I love you, isn't it? It's really easy to say that and not really, maybe really mean it. But I want to tell you something. God actually showed us how much he loves us. Maybe your daddy to show that he loves you. Maybe he'll get you a lovely present at your birthday. Or maybe sometimes when he's coming home from work, he might bring in a wee packet of sweets or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm putting bad ideas in your heads. But maybe your daddy will do wee things just to show that he loves you and to show how much he cares for you. Well, God, he did the most amazing thing to show that he loves us. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, he came down to this earth, and boys and girls, it was terrible because the people who were meant to receive him, the people who were meant to love him and adore him and receive him as their king, the Bible tells us that they rejected him. Isn't that amazing to think that God would love his people so much and send his son, and then people just rejected him. 
And you know, he was perfect. He didn't ever say anything that was wrong. He, he, never, he never took a tantrum, maybe sometimes the way we can. He never stomped out and mum and dad or was cheeky. He was really just perfect. Never did anything wrong. No sin. Didn't think anything wrong. He didn't say anything that was wrong. He didn't do anything that was wrong. He was perfect. And yet, he went to the cross and he took the punishment that you and I should have had. You see, we're sinners. We, we, we've thought wrong things and we've all said wrong things and we've all done wrong things. And sometimes maybe when you're told to tidy your room, you fold your arms, you stamp your feet and you say, no, I'm not doing it. Or maybe when you're told, maybe when you're told that it's time to come off the Xbox or the PlayStation and you're saying, oh, just half an hour more, but you know it's nearly bedtime or you know it's time to come off and you've only been told you've allowed an hour and you're now on an hour and a half. Sometimes we can be really bold, can't we? But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he went and he died for your sin and mine. He was perfect. And God the Father sent his son to go and take your punishment and mine so that we can go free. So that today, if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, that we can go free. And one day we can know we'll be in heaven with God forever. It's good to know that your daddy cares for you. But even better to know that God, our heavenly Father, cares for us. But you know, your daddy might have something, not only that he cares about, but he might have something that he really, really values. I don't know, maybe, I know that my dad, he absolutely loves his flute. How rare is that? He has a flute, and he loves to play it all the time, and that is like his treasured possession. That is the thing he loves. And I have to say, I might be very biased, but I think he's very good at it. So I understand why he's biased with that. Maybe your daddy has something else. Maybe it's a lovely car that he really loves and he's always out polishing it and it's looking really nice. Or maybe it's a wee collection of coins. Or maybe it's something that he values very, very much. Well, what does God, the Heavenly Father, tell us that he values? Well, he tells us that he values you. And he values me. And he actually tells us in his word the things that we should... You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he told you and he told me when he was speaking, he says that you and I should seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. It tells us that we should value and treasure the things of God. You know, it says, when the Lord Jesus was saying those things, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What did he mean when he said that? Well, if you're a Christian boy or girl this morning, all he was telling us to do, when we're laying up treasures in heaven, that means that we live for him. And the Bible tells us if we live for him and we love him and we try our best to serve him in many different ways, maybe like our musicians, someday you'll be able to come and serve the Lord by playing an instrument. Or maybe I know some of the teens here, they've been helping Dave, so they have over the last few weeks at the football camp. And there's ways of serving the Lord in different ways. Maybe you're a good sports person. Maybe you're good at an instrument. Maybe you're just good at having a good old conversation. Maybe you're good at going and encouraging people and making them happy and speaking to them and encouraging them like that. The Bible tells us that we can serve God in many different ways. And that's how you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven because God will reward you for the things that you do here on earth when you get to heaven. And I hope, boys and girls, I hope that everyone here, that we seek to serve God in as many ways as we can. We have a father who cares for us, just like your daddy. Maybe your daddy values something very much. Well, God teaches us that we should value the things that matter about him, that we serve him. But one final thing, you know, maybe boys and girls in your life, you'll go through some difficult times. I know maybe some of the adults sometimes when we think we go through difficult times and sad times. And boys and girls, maybe you've had a time that you felt really, really sad. And I know when I was a little boy, when I felt very sad, I would have went to my dad and he might have given me a big hug and a big cuddle and he would have encouraged me. And maybe sometimes you go to your dad and he gives you a big cuddle and he loves you and he encourages you. And when you're feeling sad, he can cheer you up. Maybe he can even make you laugh when you're feeling sad about something. But what a wonderful thing to know that when you're a Christian, 
that God, our Heavenly Father, has promised to always be with us. That means when you're feeling sad, God is there with you. But not only is he there with us, you can talk to him. And you can tell him about the things that you're going through. When you feel really sad, you can speak to God about it and tell him about it. And you know, it's amazing. And I have found so many times in life, and I know there's lots of people that can say, when you speak to God and tell him maybe something you're struggling with or something that makes you sad, and as you read his word, there's so many times that as I've prayed and I've opened his word and read it, that he's told me just what I needed to hear. And he's been with me. And boys and girls, that's why it's so important to speak with God so often and to read his word. Because how does God, our Heavenly Father, speak to us today? He speaks to us through his word, the Bible. He loves you very much. He cares for you. He teaches us what to value. And our Father is always watching out for us. We're going to sing together a little piece. It's a lovely piece, very old one. In fact, I think it's probably the most famous children's piece there is. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Boys and girls, you can leave us during the third verse. You stay in, you sing the first two verses with us. And then after we've sang on the third verse, you can leave us for Crash and Children's Church. <laughs> Turn in our Bibles this morning, please, to the book of 1 John. This is the last time that we will turn to this wee epistle in 1 John. I was looking back, and would you believe it was actually Father's Day last year that we had our first study in 1 John. I actually think I said we'll do this as a summer series last year, um, and it's taken us a year just with the different wee things. And here we've arrived in the final chapter of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, please. And we'll just take time to read the whole chapter. I would like to speak to you this morning under the title, Blessed Assurance. We began that actual title just before I went off. And I thought we would get back to it maybe a wee bit sooner. But we're here now and we're going to complete that little study on Blessed Assurance. We will recap, so don't worry um, as to what we said the last time. Blessed Assurance, and we're reading from First John chapter 5, and we'll take time to read the whole chapter. This is the word of the Lord, and it reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. 
And every one that loveth him that begat loveth also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, and he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence or assurance that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. <clears throat> if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Well, last time we visited First John, we began to consider this title that we're continuing this morning, Blessed Assurance. And we considered some of these assurances that John, as he brings his letter in a little summary in chapter 5, he gives us six things that we can be assured of, six, six things that we know. Back when John was writing his gospel in the gospel of John, he gave the reason for writing that in the gospel of John in chapter 20. And this is what he wrote there. He said, And there are many other things, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe. It was written to the unbeliever. The gospel of John was written to the non-believer. And he says, These things were written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believe in believing ye might have life through his name. So the gospel of John it was all about convincing the non-believer of their need of salvation, their need to trust Christ as their Savior. But that hasn't been John's focus in this epistle. In fact, just as we've come to the end there, in that little last verse, he uses that little phrase that we've seen a few times as we've gone from chapter 1 through to chapter 5. He says, little children, little children, you remember that John, when he was writing this letter, he was older, he was near the end of his life. And he had spent the life serving the Lord. 
And here he was, and he was writing a circular letter to many of the different churches, encouraging them to live for Christ, telling them, telling them of the things that are absolute telling them of the characteristics that should be found in the child of God, telling them of how they should live, telling them how they can be assured, how they can know that they belong to God. And that's what John has been doing. And his purpose throughout this book has been found in verse 13. He gives his purpose in his gospel in chapter 20, but in our epistle, he gives his, reading, his reason for writing the book. In verse 13, he says this, "'These things have I written unto you,' that believe on the name of the Son of God. He's writing to those who already believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, why is he writing to us? That ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's all about assurance that you will know that you have eternal life. We live in a time when people ask questions and many want to know what is absolutely certain, things that are absolutely true. And the truth is that all things that are certain can only be found within this book before us this morning. Only things that are absolutely true, perfect, that we can rely on with our whole lives are found between Genesis and Revelation in the book that's before us. Outside of the Word of God, outside of the written Word of God, we can't be sure of anything. People change. People can say things but not actually mean what they say. And you know, even outside of the Word of God, people try to look for God today. There's people who try to listen out for another revelation from the Lord and they try and claim that the voice of God has spoken. That doesn't happen. Because this book before us, it's complete. From start to finish, God has spoken and this is his full revelation to us today. God will not give or add another word to this book before us. Some people try to get a prophecy from God today. They try and say that they know what's going to happen next week, next month, and coming years. But truly, the only one who knows what the future holds is our Father in heaven. Some people try to get an extra word of knowledge outside of this book, an extra word of wisdom. Some people like to say, well, the Lord spoke to me and he told me. Well, that's not true. Because all that we find that's true and absolutely true is found within these pages. And in 1 John, he, John has made it absolutely clear that the Word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's where we find absolute truth. Did He not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But in this epistle, we find the word no 39, 39 times. And within the chapter, we have found these, this phrase, we know, seven times this morning. Things that we know and can be assured of. These are the blessed assurances of God. And last time that we visited, we considered this first, this first thing that John tells us. He tells us, tells us in verses 1 to 5 that we know who Jesus is. It's the emphasis is, is placed in trusting Christ as Savior. And a person who does this is born of God, is part of the family of God. And therefore, God then gives them victory over sin and this world. And the wonderful thing uh, that assures us of our salvation is that wonderful knowledge that we know who Jesus is. Is. Don't we sometimes sing that we want a closer walk with him, just a closer walk with thee? Granted, Jesus, this my plea, daily walking close with thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. So important that we know who Jesus is. That's where it all begins, isn't it? It's when we realized who he is and what he did for us. That's the day that we bowed the knee and trusted him as Savior. And that's where it all began. And he is absolute truth. And he went to the cross of Calvary for you. We know who Jesus is. But secondly, the last time we considered that we know as the children of God that we have eternal life. In verse 11, John writes, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, and here's the, that you may know. It says that ye may 
know that ye can have blessed assurance of what? That ye have eternal life. We thought about what it means to have the Son last time, where it says in verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. And if we know who Jesus is and we're trusting in him for salvation, then we know that we have eternal life. And that's where we got to last time that we visited the chapter. But we have four more assurances that we can, ha can be encouraged with this morning as we meet around God's word. And the next one that John speaks of in this little summary of his book is that we know that God hears us when we pray. God, we know that God hears us when we pray. As saved people, we know that someday we'll be taken to our home in heaven. And we will know that we will enjoy this eternal life that John has been speaking of in full perfection. One day we'll stand before our Father and we'll be with him eternally and we'll worship him in all our trials and all our troubles and all the things that plague us in this world will be absolutely over. But what about before then? What about the trouble that you go through today? What about that trial? What about that issue that you're just struggling with and you need to cry out to the Lord about? What about the concerns that bother you as you gather into the house of God this morning? That burden that's been really weighing you down. Well, the assurance here is that you can speak to the Lord about that. And he hears you when you pray. Verses 14 and 15, these are the words we read. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the peti petitions that we desired of him. Now, I want to clear something up very, very quickly. You may have seen posters up around different church buildings. And at one stage, I saw them on the side of the buses during my time in Scotland. And it simply says this. It says, try praying. Try praying. And these posters, they're used as an, ev an evangelistic campaign. Try praying doesn't work if you're not saved. Try praying doesn't work. The first prayer that the Lord will hear from the sinner is the cry of repentance. The cry of repentance and belief and trust in the finished work of Calvary. And the Bible makes that absolutely clear. Those posters try praying cannot be an evangelistic effort. Because the first prayer that the Lord will hear is that cry of repentance. You know, it says in John chapter 9 verse 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9, it says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, in other words, the person who doesn't want to adhere to God's law, who doesn't want to trust in him, and that person, it says, even his prayer shall be abomination. God does not hear the cry for help from the sinner unless it is the cry of repentance. And that's so important. That is biblical. That is truth. And that may be hard to swallow. If you're here this morning and you haven't put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might think that that's not a very gracious thing. But God has made it abundantly clear that he has sent his son to die for you. And only here it says in the chapter that we have read, he that hath the son hath life. I wonder, do you have the son? I wonder you trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because it's when you're in Christ and when you're abiding in Christ that when you call out to God that he hears our prayer. What an assurance for the child of God this morning. What an assurance that no matter what you go through that God hears us. And Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16 it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that lovely? The King of kings. We can come boldly before him 
because of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. You know, I know many of us, if we had the privilege of meeting Queen Elizabeth, we would probably come in not so boldly, but we would come in very reverently. And we would bow and we would call her Her Majesty. We would do all these things. And yet this morning, wherever we are, no matter where we are, we can come boldly before that throne of grace. We can cry out to the Lord with our needs and our wants. You know, when you trust someone, a close friend, a family member, could be your mother, your father, your best friend, someone you really trust, you'll speak to that person confidently because we know that they'll advise us and they will do what is best for us. And as we trust God's word and we trust God's character and we trust his motives and as we pray and as he answers, we know that he'll always do what's best for us. You see, there's an important little phrase in verse 14 that sometimes people like to skip over. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, he heareth us? No. If we ask anything, anything according to his will. He heareth us. So often when people are quoting that verse, they leave out the according to his will part. When we come into the Lord's presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice at Calvary, and when we pray in his will, when we pray and we speak to the Lord often and we spend often in the, before Him and we draw close to Him at the throne of grace as we make our petitions known to Him and we spend time in His presence, very, very quickly our will will be one with His will as we seek His face. That's why it's important to often be in prayer. I remember when I was down in Cork doing a CEF camp, there's a brother down there and his name is Stan. And Stan is a wonderful man, and I used to find it amazing because he would just stand and he might be doing something or some little job, and he wouldn't even realize he was doing it. And he spoke to the Lord that often. I remember one day he says, Lord, it's me again, and I need you again. And he just spoke so often. The, the way he spoke to the Lord, you knew that he spent time all day. He just spent time in the presence of God, praying for the children in the CEF camps, praying for safety, praying for each aspect, praying for the cooks, praying for everything. And sometimes he didn't even realize he was praying a lot. And I, he had a real impact in my life when I watched him because he was constant in prayer. And he just wanted God's will to be his will and that he would walk in God's will. And he was a man that believed prayer changes things. I wonder, do you believe that prayer changes things? The story's told about the time in revival in the Isle of Lewis when two sisters, one of them blind in their wee cottage, they, they desired that God would move in their wee land. And the two of them went down to prayer and they invited the office bearers in the local church to come and join them. And at times they would have prayed through the night. And as you read the wee book, Channel of Revival, that has the account of this, it tells you that the community became conscious, conscious of the presence of God because they sought God in prayer constantly. I wonder, are we conscious constantly of the presence of God in our life? If we know as children of God that he hears us when we pray, why so often do we lack in prayer? Why so often is the worst attended meetings the one where we go to prayer as a church fellowship? What a privilege we have to come before the King of Kings, to pray, to speak with him, to worship him, to praise him, and to ask him to make his will or will. John says we know who Jesus is. He says we know we have eternal life. He says we know that he hears us when we pray, but also he reminds us in verse 18 that we have victory over sin. This is what he says. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. We know that we have victory over sin. You've got to remember that we're in review here. 
John is just recapping many of the things that he has taught us already as we've gone through this little epistle. And we've looked over this, de- this fact that we have victory over sin in great detail as we've gone through. But as John brings his letter to a conclusion, as he brings this little fact into review, he wants to make sure that you've understood the message. He wants to make sure as the children of God that we've got to grips with what he's trying to be teaching us. He's speaking about things that are absolutely true of the children of God. These are the non-negotiables and someone who is born again of God, who is part of the family of God, who has been given a new nature, who has been transformed, who has been regenerated, will not go on with an unbroken pattern of sin. The unconverted person, they will continue to do nothing but sin. They are dead, Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, in trespasses and sins. The person who isn't trusting Christ as Savior will walk according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. They will walk according to the lusts of their flesh. They will indulge in the desires of their flesh. And by nature, they're children of wrath. There's nothing good in them. They can't do anything good because they're of the devil. Not one thing that the sinner does is profitable for eternity. Servant of unrighteousness. Many people in our world, they trample on God's law and they trample on God's love and they trample on Christ's gospel. They have no interest in it. But for the Christian, John makes it abundantly clear this morning. Here in verse 18, he says, Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now we've dealt with this in chapter 1 and I want you to look very briefly at this. In chapter 1, where it says this, It says, if we say that we have no sin, in verse 8, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that makes it clear that the Christian, yes, we still struggle with that sinful nature. And yes, we do have to often, I often have to come and confess my sin, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But what John is teaching here in verse 18, he's not contradicting himself. What he's saying to us this morning is this. He's telling us that, he's telling us that as we live for Christ, that we won't go on with habitual sin. We'll be going to war with our sin. We'll be seeking to live for Christ. I wonder, dear child of God, are you at war with your sin? I wonder, are you daily on your knees asking the Lord to help you deliver him? I wonder, do you flee from sin? Do you remember Joseph? As he ran from Potiphar's wife when he was tempted. I wonder, do you flee? What a wonderful truth we can know this morning that John has taught us earlier in the book as well, at the beginning of chapter 2, that if any man sin, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I wonder, do you remember that word propitiation, just meaning clothed in his righteousness? Not just that our sins have been wiped clean when we put our trust in him, but that Christ clothes us in his righteousness. And the Father looks at you, dear child of God, this morning, and he sees Christ who has paid the debt of your sin. We know who Jesus is. We know that we have eternal life. We know that he hears us when we pray. We know that we have victory over sin. What a lovely truth John gives us penultimately. We know that we belong to God, that we are his treasure. In a love that cannot cease, I am his and he is mine. What a lovely, lovely thought. In verse 19, this is what John reminds us. And he says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. There's no sweeter thought than to be able to say with full confidence, We are His. Belonging to the Lord. And then on the other hand, the world belongs to Satan, the evil one. And you know, as we think of that little picture, we think of the whole human system, 
And we look outside the doors of this church this morning, there's many people, and they do have that implanted desire to worship something. And maybe some people will go to a stadium throughout the year and they'll worship a football team. Or, or maybe people will worship a musician. Or maybe people will worship something else and they'll, they'll look for something to place their desires in. And these things that they look for in the world, it never fulfills them. But this morning, where are you found, dear child of God? Where have you been drawn to? In His grace, He's drawn you to His house to worship Him. And we can say we are His. And He is mine. You know, people make their gods in economics and politics and even religion and education and all these things. It could be entertainment, it could be athletics, but this morning we have found the only thing that will satisfy, and that's God himself. And we can say this morning, we know that we belong to him. That one day when this life is over, when they take this body and they put it in a wooden box and it goes down into the ground and it rots away and turns back into dust, that my soul, it belongs to God. It is his treasure that he has bought with the price of the precious blood of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that I know that because I am sealed with his blood, I belong to him and I'll be with him for all eternity. What a wonderful, wonderful thought. We belong to God. We know who Jesus is. We know that we have eternal life. We know that he hears us when we pray. We know that we have victory over sin. We know that we belong to God. And the final thing that John reminds us of this morning is we know that Christ, the Lord Jesus, is the true God. You see, what is it that he says here? In verse 20, I find this verse 20 and 21, I find these verses very interesting. It says, And we know that the Son of God has come and have given us an understanding that we, we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then he says this very strange phrase to finish his book. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. John ends his letter exactly where he started his letter. In the first few verses of the book, he says that we saw him, we heard him, we touched him. We were with the Lord Jesus. We saw the living, eternal life. We saw what is true. And John is writing this book as a witness for him. And he says that the most certain thing that we know is Christ Jesus walked this earth. And he is, he is life. And in him we find our life. And as he draws his book to a close, as he says in verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life, he comes and he confirms that we know that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus has come. He has given us understanding. He came to this earth to give us understanding. He came that we may know what is true. He came to this earth, even the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might know what eternal life is, that we might know the life of Christ. But why then does he go on? Why doesn't he finish in verse 20? Why doesn't he just finish there, finish where he started and that's it? Well, in verse 21, here's what he says. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What's this book really been all about? What is First John? Why was it written? It was written that, it was written that, of course, that ye might believe, that you might be know, that your name is written and in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's written that you might know that you have eternal life. But it's written so that in your life, John has encouraged us right through, that Christ might be central. Now, some people say that Christ should be number one. I don't think that works. Because when you make Christ number one, he's at the top of the list. But when you make Christ center, and you make him the most important thing in your life, then it filters out. You know in a pond when you throw a stone in and it ripples out? Well, if you make Christ the center, then in all the things in your life, Christ should shine through. He's not in a list. He should be center. 
And when you take Christ out of that, and you just get on with your life, you'll start to worship other things. In other words, other things will take over the centrality of Christ. Those things will become more important to you. Therefore, John, he says in a father-like way on Father's Day, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep Christ central. What a message to take home this morning. He has told us that we have so many blessed assurances. We know who Jesus is. We know we have eternal life. We know he hears us when we pray. We know we have victory over sin. We know that we belong to God. We know that Christ is the true God. And John says, keep Christ center. We're going to pray. Then we'll sing together. We'll all stay in for the final hymn this morning. And then we'll come to the table after that. Let's come before the Lord. Let's thank him for these blessed assurances that we have as the children of God. And what a wonderful thing, and we'll sing in a few moments' time that we can say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's come before him and pray. Father, we thank you for this little epistle that we have spent so long going through. Father, it has challenged our hearts so many times. Father, we realize that there's so many times in our lives that we let you down as your children. And there's so many times that we have to come and we have to claim that verse and confess our sins, knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But we thank you, Father, as your children, that we have fellowship with God. We thank you, Father, that we have fellowship one with the other in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for these wonderful things that we can say, we can know with full certainty that we have full assurance of, that we know who Jesus is, that we know that one day we will enjoy eternal life forever, that, Father, as we come before you, no matter when we come before you, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, knowing that you hear us and that you answer prayer. Father, we thank you for the victory that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us over sin. We thank you that we belong to you. And we thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. We can say that he was truly God, fully God, fully man. Thank you, Father, for these wonderful assurances we have as your children. Father, may we be encouraged in our hearts as we go out this morning. Father, may we praise you because you have given us such wonderful assurances. And Father, we just pray this in the precious name of our Savior. We pray for those who will go in a few moments' time. We pray for your blessing upon them as they leave. And Father, we pray for those of us who will remain behind and sit around the table of the Lord and remember our Savior. May it be a sweet time as we spend time in your presence again, remembering our Savior. Father, we pray all this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll all stay in for our final hymn, and then um, just when this closes, if you must leave us, um, then we'll meet you at the door after we have sang this together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Now, this is my favorite hymn. This is my ultimate favorite, so you have to sing it out because I love it the best. So we'll stand and sing after the introduction. Mm -hmm.